two questions kind of related. The first question is, have you come across a study which would um, talk about the correlation between Alzheimer's and uh, development of Alzheimer's and the use of technology? No, I'm afraid not. Second question is, so Gwen said that if we do not have a word for a thought, we will lose the thought. Very knowing different languages allows you to, every language has a diff, slightly different nuance that you really can't capture in any other language, in, in some ways, to some degree. Um, if we are giving young kids cell phones from the very early on, have you come across anything that would suggest that this inhibits their ability to learn uh, from languages? The research I've seen, I should say first off, not I have never encountered something so precise as that. The research I've seen though um, shows that these children will be less capable of learning as a rule. Um, this would, of course, affect the way that they understand languages. And as you say, since understanding new languages so um, radically expands the way that we understand the world and the way that we understand our own native tongue, usually, um, this, again, has further serious effects. I, again, I say I have never found something so precise as the study for which you ask, um, but the effects on learning, memory, and concentration will already throw a wrench into the works of any type of education. I, <laughs> further, this is more pressing because schools in general are using more and more um, internet devices as a supposed uh, furtherance of education. Um, as we saw with the early ideas about hyperlinked text, though, the conclusion that these technologies actually aid in education is very likely misguided. Yes, Matthew? So, Timothy, thank you so much for weaving together this fabric. keep in our minds um, as we will inevitably continue using this, this medium. I had uh, two questions that are interrelated, uh, and so I will ask them all together. Um, the first question, um, what do you define as the internet? Uh, and I ask this because the internet is something that, you know, this doesn't necessarily need a screen. So when you put a card into a card reader, it uses the internet to transfer your bank information and so on and so forth. Um, so, and then when you look at, let's say you're reading a, a paper through Microsoft Word, you may have some of the same distraction that there is no internet being used there. And so what exactly is the internet? Um, how do you define it? And I am spe I'm specifically interested in this question with regard to uh, a related question about some of the medium that you media that you mentioned. I'm thinking of medieval manuscripts in which there is hyperlinking involved, uh, slightly different than what we see on the internet. But nevertheless, there are antennas, are um, extensions of text. Sometimes you have a primary text in the center, then you have, uh, let's say, a quote from a church father around it. And very often, uh, people who read these uh, manuscripts would add their own you know, marginalia, their, their own comments, and then further readers would, would contemplate. And there's quite a conversation occurring on the page itself that, and I'm also thinking, you know, academic texts have a lot of footnotes. Those are certain kinds of hyperlinks that they're just right there on the page. So to, to what degree is the hyperlinking a medium of the internet, and to what degree is it its own medium, or it, perhaps not even a medium, it's just a a way of conflating together bits of information and then separating them on just enough that you can, you know, jump from one to the other. Um, so, so to what degree are we talking about the internet here? 
Well, I think I'll answer your second question about hyperlinks first. Um, when I last gave this presentation in class, we discussed the fact that footnotes have a similar effect on your concentration. As soon as you encounter the little mark on the page, the number, the dot, you have to make the decision, will I go elsewhere to read the footnote or will I continue with what I'm reading? It immediately, it has that same um, effect of changing your focus from decision making, uh, from comprehension to, de to decision making. So um, I'm not surprised to hear that hyperlink is older. I hadn't thought of it in um, such ancient texts as you mentioned. Um, I would say the effects of footnotes and these marginalia would be um, much less pronounced because they don't, they don't allow you to enter an entirely new uh, text. You're given some commentary on what you're already reading. Um, uh, Coleridge, in his uh, Rime of the Ancient Mariner, left marginalia himself to explain certain difficult verses. This allowed certain commentary and maybe even a deeper comprehension um, once you'd gotten past that quick break in focus. But it wouldn't allow you to enter into an entirely new book by Keats, um, which is what hyperlinked uh, text on the internet allows you to do. So the tool is probably old. It um, tool is very old. It's used to astonishing effect on the internet. Now, what I would define as the internet would be um, the modern, much more approachable, much more attractive form in which the connection of all of our websites um, exists. So when the internet first appeared, it was something quite difficult to use. You have to type out all the links letter by letter. But eventually it was developed into a f forum where um, communication became lightning fast. And then with the advance of internet technologies, um, such as the Apple computers, it became more and more attractive. The goal, one of the goals of um, Apple was to make the computer something which somebody wanted in their home, not simply a tool for work. Um, so I would define it, I should be more clear to say that I define it as the modern um, attractive, really seductive um, connectivity, um, which is this hub of um, many different websites and um, various new media available to us. Yes, Your Eminence? specifically in the, in the computer or um, software uh, world, the, the, um, the people that are profiting from the use of the internet, like Apple Computer, Microsoft, etc., and, and other smaller companies. For the concerns that you mentioned, there, there are lots of creative thinkers there. Obviously, they're they, they must have some knowledge, some of them must have some knowledge about the studies that you referenced, the fact that this is not actually a panacea for educational needs of our children and things like that. For example, I, I, I remember reading maybe a decade ago about a, uh, a private school in the Silicon Valley area that a lot of uh, Silicon Valley um, elite were sending their children to where they were not allowed to use smartphones, tablets, etc., pencils and papers basically were all the only tools they were given up to a certain level, a certain grade, and they were expected to develop again the, the primary social skills and, and reading skills and communication skills and so on that you talk about that are so important for education and whatnot. Um, I noticed that Apple Computer has a reading mode in its browser that you can click on and all the hyperlinks disappear and you have just plain text on the thing and 
that obviously was prompted by somebody perhaps savvy about these concerns. At any rate, is there is there much pushback on this in, in, in the industry and in the world? Is it is there hope that it might you know it, it might improve, the situation might improve, or is it do you think it's going to deteriorate or what you know about such uh, pushback? Well, uh, you're right to say that many of the people who actually design and sell these technologies are the ones who bar their children from using them. Um, but this is actually something which um, is simply more f disturbing than it is encouraging because, uh, as you'd imagine, um, somebody like that who makes his living off of these technologies um, is very unlikely to begin advertising the damage they have on various faculties. Um, more and more, actually, they have campaigns about how to get internet technologies available to the youth. You see advertisements from Toys R Us of children's iPads with um, thousands of games on them. They have uh, parental lock to avoid um, adult material leaking in, but they're introducing them to children at a very early age. So yes, the people that um, build these technologies often um, keep their children away from them, but they ha seem to have little interest in keeping others' children away from them. And the awareness of it is very, very low. Um, I, um, it does exist, but it's something like the early um, research that was done and uh, the effects that processed cane sugar has on you for a while. Um, it was not a popular thing at all to publish such research. And now, as I said, people are either ignorant or um, ambivalent to it. Um, the impression you get of your experience of, of the internet is so much one of growing in intelligence. Um, people uh, don't believe you when you tell them that it's, uh, it's the opposite. Um, now, as far as their pushback, Unfortunately, they seem to be leaning into the opposite direction. So the more studies that come out about the problems with internet reading, um, the memory deficits, the more um, often the, uh, the people pushing these technologies will claim that it's simply a matter of eventually developing to this new medium. Eventually, we will become the kind of people who can use this um, and not do harm to ourselves. So the effects currently are not great, but they eventually say perhaps we'll, we'll achieve a new kind of concentration, which will allow us to skip nimbly from one site to another without losing our focus. They will allow, allow us to absorb many streams of information at once. Um, it's something like the multiverse theory. There seems to be no basis for it. Um, it's simply the idea that if we push longer and harder, eventually it will change. So there's very little support uh, on the corporate scale for these ideas. Another question? Um, as, as we succumb to pressure and genuine need in our potential uh, spots, students in the future, and, and employ more online learning, what do you, what do you want to tell us? Online learning is almost always more superficial, and um, based off of. And, and, and distance learning, let me put it that way too. Yeah, so you well, yes. the need for that. If yes, we well, uh, we've. Africa or China that, that we need to offer our services to and simply can't travel. Well, first off, I'd say we've had a good deal of experience recently with remote learning. Uh, the experience is not at all a good one. It's not traumatic. It's simply exhausting for the teachers and the students. Um, for some reason, it requires uh, much more focus. Even to be in the room with uh, the screen going, zooming in other students. And those students on the other end, you can often tell, are much less engaged in the, um, in the lesson because they're, I, I, this is a guess, I would guess that their brain understands they are not in the same room as these other students and as this teacher. Therefore, they are exempt from certain standards. Um, you sometimes see people um, 
uh, zooming into meetings or lessons. Um, not, not here, I had a, a class in Latin a while ago when uh, the teacher was eating his dinner as he was um, teaching the course. Um, the, the, style, the, um, the style is so much more informal, I, I would guess, because the brain understands I am not present with other humans. Um, the visual is not is not strong enough, so we haven't we certainly haven't adapted to that um, style of learning. So, uh, on that level, I would say remote learning is more superficial. I think that if you look at statistics of remote degrees, often the success rate is much lower. Um, there's just less of a of an idea of having skin in the game. You're not there with your instructors all the time to be reprimanded if um, you're not on time with an assignment. I think. Um, you must have had some experience of this with the old CTOS program. Um, so I think it has, has similar effects. Perhaps, I mean, if you, catch, if you catch one in 50 students and really give them a good education, maybe it would even be worth it. Um, you will not achieve nearly as much as you will with students with seats and chairs in the room. Two-part question that that I like to uh, ask. First, you you've done a very uh, compelling um, job of of highlighting sort of the change in, in thinking and focus. Um, I had the temptation to check my phone uh, during during your presentation, and uh, so that just further reinforced your point. Um, so I, I don't think you have any argument from, 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 uh, from that perspective, but um, are there benefits to, are there, is there a potential benefit to, from an Orthodox Christian perspective for the development of our spiritual life due to this technology of the internet? Um, is the first question, and then and then the second question would follow up in regards to the distance learning, which uses such technologies. And I know that um, within within today's world, there's a lot of parents that may feel uncomfortable of educating their children in public schools and may not afford private schools that would be placing, you know. Uh, people in, in the classroom, in seats, and, and they opt for a hybrid uh, version of homeschooling. Um, and, and thankfully, we have the St. John of Damascus initiative that would allow parents all around the country to um, leverage the skill sets and knowledge of other Orthodox Christians that are qualified to teach on certain subjects that they may not you know, find themselves to be qualified. Um, so in, in such a case, are the potential detrimental effects of the internet, I guess, overcome by the potential positives, in, in your opinion? Good question. Um, I think it's inarguable that something is better than nothing in the case of Orthodox education. Um, the only argument I would have against the benefits of um, strictly remote education is that if you become too comfortable with it, perhaps you're less inclined to move closer to a teacher and therefore thereby reap the full um, benefits of being in the room with a teacher. The, the experience is um, three-dimensional versus two-dimensional, effectively. The, so in that case, in the case of something being better than nothing, and the St. John of Damascus program providing something where there was nothing, there is benefit to our spiritual life. In general, the benefits that the internet provides for our spiritual life are secondary, while the dangers it provides are primary. So if you use the internet as a source for texts, and for lectures um, by elders and bishops, um, 
And if it's simply a source of information for you, i.e. a, a high-tech printing press, um, it can um, be very beneficial. But the more you have contact with it, the more you actually use it as a tool, the internet itself, the more it has these effects on you. So if you can, now it seems like everything is available online, albeit some things for a price. Um, that is very useful. All of the publications that the GOC puts out on its website, um, that the seminary is now putting out, um, all of the scanned texts from the fathers and the scriptures readily available. Um, it's, a, it's a real boon to us. Um, my argument is not with the good things which can be provided by the internet, uh, which I would put in the category of content. My argument is with the medium itself. Matthew? Yeah, I have uh, one more question. The first time when the Telegraph came out, the, uh, an objection to it was posed, well, why should I know what is happening, let's say, what the weather is like in a city in another state? Like, why do I need that information at all? And it, it serves to point that the access that we have to all kinds of things that are happening around the world have increased and continue to increase, I would say, almost exponentially. We are inundated with all the problems, not just of our immediate locale, let's say, but also of the region, the nation, the world, the global sphere. It has created an atmosphere that is so incredibly stress stressful that we find the internet um, double functioning as simultaneously that place at which we find all these stressors and the place that we go to to de-stress. And so far we have focused on education, or at least the acquirement of knowledge, in which case I think the answer is very clear cut, that the acquirement of knowledge is not best done through this medium. But I wonder about the, the when we go to it for entertainment, for escapism, and for precisely the kind of distraction that allow at least our minds to escape the inundation of the continual stressors that have only multiplied in modern life and will continue to do so. Um, to what degree is the internet effective for that? Or is the entertainment also <laughs> poison, so to speak, with the same kind of um, traps that you had pointed out? Pointed out? It's a really interesting point because um, in the internet you have both the source and the at least um, temporary suppressor of stress. So while you get the stress from it, you have to return to the fount for something um, to assuage the stress. So um, what little research I've done in that field shows that the, the internet is um, incredibly attractive as a medium of entertainment, not simply when you have something entertaining going on on the screen, not simply when you have a, a game or um, you're reading a book maybe, God help you, on the internet. The, um, it's entertaining as itself because uh, as one um, lecturer I heard speaking about it said, the internet is, um, is a novelty machine. And we are geared as, um, as learning rational creatures to crave novelty. Um, novelty means value to us. Um, we see it in all the advertising. Novelty is, is framed as value, and that's, that's the way we see things. So the novelty is this, f so the internet is this font of novelty. Um, unfortunately, this actually um, simply attaches us very powerfully to the internet and to those technologies we use to access it. And thereby, you're attaching yourself to the source of your stress. So all the, all the while, as you're um, supposedly repressing the stress, you're also building it. Um, furthermore, they've shown that um, this attachment to the internet slowly begins to weaken the frontal cortex. So inhibition control is um, 
decreased, to say the least. Um, you become more and more childish as you have the, uh, the ability to activate your desires immediately, um, usually in your pocket. So this um, novelty machine is um, weakening the part of our brains which allows us self-control, or which is linked to self-control most strongly. Um, that's a, more of a roundabout way of answering your question. Um, yes, Father? Well, forgive me. One thing that really shocked me, um, when finding out about recent uh, violations of human rights and um, well, genocides going on in the world, um, when watching a documentary, uh, it, it, it hit me very deeply. And I felt it in, in a very strong way. And you were there. I asked my students whether they even heard about the, the genocides going on in such and such a country this day. And I was totally shocked to find out that my, none of my students have actually even heard about these um, genocides. Which leads me to another thing. With this overcrowding of information, and even shocking information that should really, um, should really influence us in a way to think soberly our, about our lives, have we become desensitized to this information through the overabundance of it because of the internet? Uh, yes, as far as I've seen. So, um, as Matthew said, um, because the internet allows us to be everywhere, in a way it requires us to be everywhere. It makes us, it makes our realm of responsibility so much larger. In, a, in times past, um, your decisions were not necessarily so complicated because you did not know as much about the wider world. Um, Pardon me, just to answer that. What I find is that even my generation, when I was in college, um, and that's not too far back, uh, we were much more aware about the genocides that were going on. Um, and the odd thing is that it seems as though, even though communication information was less available, it seems as though in past times, people were more aware and more deeply aware of the things going on around the world, which was, is what really shocked me. It was Sorry. more novel. The information was more novel. Um, there, it, as you're inundated with it, eventually you lose the ability to care about it. This is, a, again, a point that Darche makes. Um, Jordan Peterson also makes the point in terms of the stories you hear about people. The story of one girl whose family lost everything to a flood um, in Indonesia will strike you much more than the story of a million who died in a flood. You simply, you're somehow less capable of caring as deeply about the number because the number is so overwhelming it would kill you if, you, if you've carried the same amount about each one of those people. Um, so there, eventually, as the number increases, the amount that you're involved um, with those people and with those stories, uh, because stories about genocide um, come in more and more, I'm afraid, or about at least huge human rights violations. Um, they come in more and more, and we care less and less about them. I, unfortunately, this puts us right on line with what Stalin said about statistics, that um, when a single man dies, it is a tragedy. When a thousand men die, it is a statistic. Um, unfortunately, he was very accurate. If you tell people that 10,000 have died, it's a number to them. If you tell them one person has died, it's actually a death. Um, so I believe it has to do with the number of stories and the amount of information that comes in that um, it actually makes us close ourselves off more and more, especially young people. The information is coming in at um, fire hose intensity, and it actually makes them retreat further into their own s very small world. Um, it's a, eventually it becomes a defense mechanism. You simply can't deal with this amount of information. I, I'm struck. I'm struck by this idea of this fount of novelty, of always something having new coming at you. Um, because, you know, C.S. Lewis writes 
in his book, The Four Loves, about affection being one of a, a type of love, which is primarily um, based on familiarity, that you grow affectionate to something that you have a lot of contact with. And it, you know, it, it takes time and repeat exposure to something you know, to become affectionate. You know, you might not, not necessarily like it at first, but because it's sort of part of your life, you sort of start to develop affection, and then, and then you might even miss it when it's gone, right? Um, so would, do you think that the internet, in the same way that it's affecting on a deeper level our capacity for memory and learning and, and critical thinking, do you think the amount of novelty constantly being thrown at us reduces our capacity for affection, developing affection, and therefore developing a, a form of love? I don't know about that. I, um, I, I know that the connection we feel for uh, our devices and for the internet in general, while very strong, is a fleeting one. I, I'm less certain about its effects on our relationships and our affections in general. Um, I know that although we're very attached to our phones, often um, I've switched to a flip phone more than once in my life and the, the effect is um, almost instantaneous. You simply stop thinking about the, the connectivity you had. Now if you were cut off entirely it's, it's a different matter. They did uh, certain experiments in school where they disallowed children from using their devices in school, uh, comprehension increased, and the children actually um, stated that they felt some relief from the amount of pressure this constant inundation of knowledge exerted on them. Now, again, if you actually took away all of their devices and access to the internet, you'd probably have a different result. Um, I, so uh, I'm afraid that most of what I know is about our affection for the internet and our devices and less about how that affects the rest of our relationships. I had to work to go to college, and I got a job as a PBX operator. You know, this kind of thing. My father was very strict. In 1948, when I'm eight years old, there will be no TV in the house. We will lose family conversations with each other. That went on for three years. But man's been trying to communicate since the separation from God. And I was a resident of Oklahoma and we saw the smoke signals as communication. And then following that, the telephone. When you had, you know, party lines. And you pick up the phone and someone's talking and you had to hang it back up again. So now we've reached in 2021 the growth of communication. Father George Chi was a CTOS graduate by correspondence. I think in answer to your question, we as Orthodox Christians do not have to be sucked into the innovations of time. So if we have students in Indonesia, as an example, whom God is calling to us for the Orthodox training, I think we should rethink how CTOS did it and maybe continue using our mail systems and not be sucked into speed. Because that's all the internet is. From the smoke signal coming up from one Indian camp to the other, to today, when everything has to be instant. The British love to make tea by steeping it and by harvesting the bush that they grow the leaves on. It's an art, but a tea bag is not an art. A tea bag is speed. Boil the water, dunk it in, enjoy. And in the Chinese culture, they have special dishes just to protect all the beautiful flavors. And you don't lift it off there until you're told it's ready. So I think I love the book Time and Man because it teaches us 
what our enemy is. We are eternal as Orthodox Christians in the process coming out of a temporal life. And I think the internet challenges us to give that up. But so did the telephone. So did the smoke signal. Man, when he's separated from God, he has to be proud to find a way to return that connection. So everything is taking him further away. And that's what concerns me about anything that's innovative. So I, I went through a lot. You know, you know how old people always tell you <laughs> their stories. But in the way of communication, I purposely got a call today from Alexei to come and hear you. I've been trying to call you all day, Via Gonessa. I was in Marika. I didn't pick up my phone. It irritates my children. <laughs> but I'm doing it for a very good, sound reason. Slow down your life and take notice. My daughter Susan is a math teacher. She hates the COVID year because math has to communicate eyeballs, as she says. And the Zoom program just about basically put most of her students behind all year. They didn't even resume class. All the children are on summer break now. So, I, it's very telling what you say about speed. I know my grandmother refused to have a landline in her home because she considered it uh, offensive that an, um, sometimes even a stranger could intrude into her house unannounced. There was no barrier between um, what they would like her to hear and what she needed to say in response, as opposed to a letter which would arrive and she could wait days before responding to it and carefully craft what she wanted to say. Um, she disliked this informality and this speed which came with um, the new media. Um, and it, it only increases. Uh, as to what you say about rethinking the old C2S correspondence program, um, it's not up to me, but um, the idea is an interesting one because people usually don't think about going back to something which was older and perhaps refining the process. The idea is always that uh, what is new is key. Um, what is new is king. Well, um, yeah. But Father George was still required to come here to write his thesis. So there's, there were requirements to save money, to leave Vashon, come down here, spend a whole week, write his paper, five times corrected, as Father Protavios remembers. We call it the paper with the red ink, you know. But you see, that inner relationship is, is a message I can still tell today because I experienced it. And that's the tragedy that I see in our young people as a past teacher. They don't deal in interpersonal histories except in evil ways. Nudity on Instagram among 14 and 15 year olds. But with anything in this fallen world, we just have to be wise about it. So your information is very, very necessary so that we can make a choice. It's always gratifying to hear as a man of 22 that people want to hear what I have to say. So thank you for inflating that sense of self-entitlement a little further. Be <laughs>